Greetings, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning. To everyone. Uh, welcome. Let me start by just asking you for for those that who would want translation, if you could um, please not our conversation today will be translated. And I'll just ask our hosts to to put up the translation instructions. Um, Yvonne, would you want to just give us the translation instructions? Hello, everyone. Uh, at the panel, at the control panels, do you see the interpretation, uh, interpretation icon? Even. Yes. Yeah, I, I think the administrator didn't enable it because, as as interpreter, we didn't receive any. We we cannot see uh, the. I can't icons. see it as well. Yeah, uh, so uh, we will proceed to enable it. Okay. Just after recording, there's another icon next. We need to press on that. Okay. Let me open you all. My name is Memory Kachambwa and I'm the executive director for FEMNET. I would like to welcome you all to our second Power Policy Dialogue. It's so great to see all of you. Today we are having a conversation which is really timely, looking at how on Monday we celebrated the Africa Day, Africa Liberation Day. So we are still within that same spirit that today we are having a conversation on Pan-Africanism and feminism. We cannot uh, address the COVID-19 unless we know who we are. So we are calling you today to join us with our amazing panelists and guest speakers, as well as our amazing moderator. I will not say much, but I really want to invite you all to take your pens out, to put on your listening ears. This is part of the dialogues that we are holding as FemNet, where we are talking about, where we are speaking to power. And our first dialogue was talking to CDC and the African Union Gender Directorate. So today we bring in the conversation home. We are rooting ourselves within our Pan-Africanism we cannot address this pandemic unless we go back to who we are, unless we question and root ourselves within our Pan-Africanist ethos and ideals. So let me welcome, without much uh, further ado, Mirel, Mirel Tushimina. I'll just pause for our translator, sorry. Mireille, donc vous avez la parole. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You know, bonjour, bonsoir à tout le monde. Uh, wherever you are, I definitely greet you in a spirit of pan Africanism. Oh, we are all unified um, because we are our African identity. And uh, I'm incredible, incredibly honored to be moderating this identity. <laughs> Um, a session that is really giving us the time and telling the to revisit the idea and envision uh, the future of Africa. I forgot to tell you guys that I am originally from the DRC, the Democratic of the Congo. And again, I don't dance, I cannot sing, but I'm a proud Pan-African. And, um, and for them, uh, for those joining us for the first time, I'm sure, you know, FAMNET will share more on the PPD dialogues, and I will definitely encourage everyone 
uh, to join as if um, it is time for us to to really try to set the tone for more conversations uh, around our African identity and women, the involvement of women and young girls in Pan-Africanism as a whole. So to help us do that today, uh, we have with us what I call uh, the feminist we love, um, Professor Amina Mama, who is no stranger to many. Uh, she's a writer, she's a feminist, she's an academia. And for those who have come across her work, uh, you guys, you know, uh, uh, those who are familiar with it, uh, she often focused on post-colonial uh, militarism and gender issue. And herself personally described herself as um, feminist, not a womanist. And um, uh, she argue, often argues that feminist uh, feminism originated in Africa and that white feminists <laughs> Uh, has never been strong enough to be enemy. And in that way, uh, global capitalism can be viewed as enemy. So uh, she has criticized definitely uh, the discourse of women in development for stripping gender issues of uh, politically uh, meaningful um, uh, feminism. And, um, and she has written uh, a lot of books, which I recommend uh, many of us if we don't have uh, we don't have Kendall or anywhere, but you should have at least one of her books in your bookshelves. The one that I have is Beyond Identities, Rethinking Power in, in Africa, which I recommend everyone um, to read. And of course, we also have in the room, I'm not seeing him on the list, but I hope he's there, is my brother, um, Brian Kagoro, who's a celebrated Pan-Africanist. Uh, he's a mentor to many. Uh, he has done a lot of things, amazing things in, in, on our continent. And for those that followed him on, on, on Twitter, he's one of those thought-provoking thinkers that will basically initiate, initiate the, the fire in you when you read his tweet. And one of my favorite, uh, my favorite was early on in the, and uh, when uh, the pandemic started and in particular started touching Africa was um, African Lives Matters, um, COVID-19 as an unearthed deeply concealed prejudice and gross in, uh, inequalities in our communities around the world. He has also created a new dimension of otherization and compounded historical pre uh, prejudice against Africans and Afro descent across the, uh, the, um, the globe. And which is exactly why we are here today to learn more about his thinking and to try to leverage uh, uh, from both of their experience and to see how we can carry on the work that we do on the continent. And also I wanted to, to highlight again that we do have interpretation and feel free Uh, spécialement pour uh, uh, les francophones, uh, donc uh, l'interprétation elle est uh, uh, similée, donc uh, vous pouvez uh, um, écrire vos questions dans le, dans le chat box et comme ça, ça donnera plus de temps aux interprètes de, de, de traduire vos questions et comme ça, vous pourrez faire partie de, uh, de la discussion. So, without a further interruption, I will dive into the conversation and, and ask Prof. Uh, Amina Mama, welcome, welcome. So you'll be the first one and thank you, Brian. Um, I wanted to first, before asking you about uh, your journey to uh, your Pan-Africanist journey, I wanted you to share about your story and to talk about you and, 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 and how you identify yourself as a agent of change and uh, a powerful feminist, African feminist of, uh, of our time. If you can share a little bit of your story before diving into the journey. Thank you to join my community here. Um, it's a great honor. Uh, my computer died, so the name is actually that of my daughter, Abian Mama Farah. I've had to borrow her computer, but yes, I am Amina Mama. Um, uh, you know, as Africans, we don't like talking about ourselves. And I'm just going to remind you of the uh, title that you cited, Beyond Identity. 
I want to also make a push for thinking beyond our individual selves. I want to make a push for what we're going to be talking about today, which is the collective identity of common interests that we as Africans must identify and pursue and share. Um, my individual identity, I don't think it's that interesting. I'm a Nigerian. I have a one European British parent. Uh, my father's a Nupe man who's turned 89 two weeks ago. Uh, grew up in northern Nigeria. Um, and I'm currently, I, I've moved around uh, in quest of work. I consider myself a, a migrant worker within the, mostly within the university system. So you've said enough um, about me. On identity, I will say uh, we will dwell on culture and identity because as people with a history of imperialism and colonization, as people whose identities, whose cultures, whose politics have been suppressed and thwarted, we do have to recover. We do have to pay attention to who we are, where we came from, and we have to draft, draw on legacies, the legacies that we choose to identify, not the colonial archive. At the moment, the colonial archive is still very dominant. So part of our future is to carve out our own archive. And I'd like to really just start by saying where we come from matters. In a crisis such as we're experiencing today with uh, COVID, where we came from may matter, but what really matters is where we're aiming to go to. So I want us to try and begin um, to do what, uh, you know, our generation, the anti-colonial generation always did, which was to think beyond individuality, beyond the messed up identities that colonialism, empire, and indeed Hollywood, today's global media, would uh, ascribe to us. So we have a constant re-identification, reaffirmation process. So today I came because of Africa Day, a bit of history, um, I'm happy to share some of the historical recovery work that this movement, women from this movement, have been doing because we have absolutely transformed history. And I think we can, at a time like this, we should look to the past a bit because we need to dig deep. We need to draw on the best and most powerful of our legacies and our ancestries and, and carry those forward with us. So that's kind of from our conversation. Um, that's what I understood we would share. So like Femnet, I have a few slides if that's of interest, or we can just have a more direct conversation. But my first proposition is that the reasons for discussing identity and culture in the post-colonial era are to get over the past and draw the best of our strengths from our histories of struggle and use those to inform us in charting the archives, the identities, the politics of African unity for the future. Thank so that's you. my statement. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and in, in fact, is, uh, that is why most of us were here. We're here because we do have, we have to draw from our legacy and, and really have the younger generation, the next generation, help to identify really who they are. Um, I myself as a mother and a lot of us here as a mother, we are struggling really to position the next generation for them to embrace uh, the Africanism or the African in them. And I'm just hoping that this conversation will also help us uh, on the other hand to converse with them, to carry on the conversation. So my next question will be, um, you know, walk us through your Pan-Africanism journey. How did it start? What were the conditions back then uh, when you started and how uh, uh, was possible for you to really claim your identity? You've worked on very quite challenging issues that, uh, you know, really were quite hard to, to address at that time and, and people were not really comfortable hearing about it. But at that time, what was the, what were the, the tenant and what was really the idea of Pan-Africanism? Uh, honestly, when I grew up, in, it was in Nigeria in the early 60s. I'm older. So uh, during the 60s, Nigeria was emerging as a big nation when I was a child. So I would say that um, I didn't think about uh, an African identity um, or a Pan-African identity. And you, know, you, you see it when you go out of your country. 
Um, so we all knew we were Nigerian, um, and in my case, mixed Nigerian, which is its own thing. But mostly I began to understand Africa in a global perspective, really when I went outside. So a part of the Pan-African legacy that I bring via my trajectory is the global dispersal of Africa. Like many of uh, those of us of that generation went abroad to study and it gave us a global perspective on our continent. Um, first of all, we met all the other Africans. So my Pan-Africanism in terms of actual political work began in London um, when um, in Akinamamawa, Africa in the 1980s when we were students um, working with uh, Wanjiru Kihoro, Loretta and Hobo, um, the founding members of Akinamamawa, Africa, which as most of you will know, began in London in about 19, must be about 1985, somewhere around there. So that was the first pan-African forum because in Nigeria there's win, women in Nigeria. So we met, you know, within our nation or with the um, uh, various things I was involved in there. So pan-African came via the diaspora. Mm -hmm. I joined in Mamawa, Africa. Later I joined Abantu. Um, and I had those kind of linkages when I returned home to Nigeria. We began building Abantu and for development which still has a very active office in West Africa, in Accra. And uh, after Abantu, I, I moved to South Africa and put in 10 years <laughs> at the uh, historically white University of Cape Town in Kapstad. So it's a bit of a, a Pan-African. And then, you know, I'm from West Africa. Um, I married a man from East Africa. And then we as a family began our, uh, 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 with the young children in South Africa, in Cape Town. University, where the project I was hired to was Africanization. And of course, I went there as a feminist after many years of training and struggle within Codestria, the an African scholarly network. And we built up a little space there for a few years at the African Gender Institute, where I worked, met more and more Zimbabwe and Southern Africans. I think at the Institute, we hosted several hundred, it was never enough, but several hundred African feminists over Hundreds, yeah. So that's really my grounding isn't uh, my isolation trajectory. The, the grounding of formulating and thinking it solidly happened in South Africa, which was just beginning to discover Africa. Yeah, so the Renaissance and Becky, Becky's year. So we, I was in, I chose to be in environments where developing uh, um, African consciousness was a project I could take. But it all depended on the network. So I want to say that there is no pan anything unless we have our continental community. So most of what um, I think has been important is the work of people like Femnet, the, the building of pan-African networks. Because when I grew up, you couldn't communicate across Nigeria. It was a DHL that got lost, you know, and cost $50. So now we have the technology. And in fact, that coincided with my move to South Africa. Actually, I was tired of the lack of electricity in Kaduna went to Cape Town, infrastructure, electricity, and my colleagues there really had the ideas to run with the digital format. So we began teaching and activism and publishing online. That's Feminist Africa. And that's really my, my implementation. As someone who ran, I can do editing and publishing. But together. So it's a community building, the activism, movement building work, I think. Well, wow, thank you. Very impressive. Um, there is amazing comment in the chat group because obviously your life, your story, the work that you have done, it really changed the perspective of how some African women have been approaching uh, the work that they are doing on the, 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 on the floor, on the groundwork, and have, have changed their lives, many lives, in a positive way. So one thing, um, uh, we'd love you to share your... Uh, your PowerPoint presentation, so it could be made available to everyone to go over it if you can. And my next, and one of my next question, uh, I know you did talk about uh, identity, and you identify as you identify yourself as a feminist and and an African woman um, as an act of resistance and. Uh, looking at the comment, it seems like there's a lot of more, uh, more of us that want to hear more about uh, 
what is the role of uh, uh, women in Pan-Africanism? And if you can share some of your stories, we want to know about the challenges and, and some of the success stories, you know, that got you by far today for you to be able to speak to us in the time of a pandemic. Okay, um, I'm seeing if I can get the slides up. Because sure. uh, at my age, I'd much rather you looked at those. Um, I mean, uh, Mirelle, if I can just interject, we are trying to set up the French translation. Okay. But yes, so in the meantime, if you could kindly ask the interpreters to just interpret. So, um, okay. I mean, I, yes, so as the slides are being shared, just no interject problem. to share. Yes. Okay, no problem. Is the, the translators, are they ready? Oui. Okay. Okay. Merci. Au fait, s'il y a moyen de de faire un petit résumé. Oui. A small summary. Oui, Seigneur. Merci. Um, okay. It was a little bit difficult to follow because uh, we were trying also to find out about the system. I don't know if you could maybe do a summary, and I could just follow what you say and then do it and then translate it for the delegate. Donc, tu veux que je répète ce qu'elle a dit? Yeah, please. Oui, mais bon, elle a parlé. Bon, au fait, son focus était plus sur euh, notre identité africaine, notre identité africaine, et le fait qu'elle avait commencé euh, sur son vrai, au fait, euh, son identité panafricaine, ça a commencé quand elle avait. Ça a commencé mal, mais ça a été un peu plus appuyé. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's somebody else who has his microphone on. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Uh, th there was somebody else having his microphone on. Somebody else had his microphone on. Ah, okay, okay. No, en bref, elle a expliqué comment, uh, uh, s -s -s uh, au fait, son parcours panafricain qui a commencé uh, à l'étranger quand elle était uh, uh, à Londres. Donc, c'est moi qui fais le travail, là, on dirait. No, uh, okay. Uh, actually, what happened is that uh, she gave us a briefing about uh, her journey when she was in London and how she, she came out to uh, know about the African movement, the Pan-African movement, yeah? No, 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 no. So basically what Memory was asking, if uh, um, the French translator could uh, translate oh, okay. for the francophones. Oh, okay. okay. So then the, the French translator said that he did not quite grasp most of the conversations. So, so that's why I thought it was only a dialogue him and I. So I was basically briefing him on what transpired. Okay. So if you can share, no, that's fine. You can just translate from what you have. Bon, je crois que maintenant le système d'interprétation fonctionne. Okay. Uh, pour les francophones, uh, dites-leur de choisir d'aller au, au fond de la page. Il y a le drapeau français qui choisissent le drapeau français pour suivre tout ce qui sera dit d'une manière simultanée en français. Et okay. pour ceux qui uh, connaissent l'anglais. Ils vont rester dans le canal. Oui, oui, oui. oui. Est-ce que les francophones, est-ce que les francophones ont entendu S'ils ont entendu, ils peuvent dire, euh, dire oui. Ou sinon, je peux. Uh, I would like to find out if uh, all the francophones were able to understand exactly what uh, we have said in terms of interpretation, because now the system works. The system works. Oui. Donc pour euh, pour le français, il y a le drapeau, il y a le drapeau français. Tous ceux qui ont à faire. French. Uh, you just uh, for the francophone, you have to select the French flag. Oui, c'est tout. And non, they say that's okay. Everyone is okay. They say ça marche. Voilà, c'est que tout ça marche déjà. Ok, professeur Amina, are you, are you back? Okay. Uh, professeur Amina, est-ce que vous êtes de retour? Yes, I'm here. Oh, ok, great. So, yes, so the next question Alors, bon. was, Alors, uh, question suivante, was about you working on the question. Uh, the question was about you working on the question. And you identify yourself as a... Vous avez pu vous identifier. 
an African and an actor. Uh, en tant qu'Africaine et également une, une actrice. Uh, women in, uh, uh, surtout dans le rôle des femmes. Et point le plus important, c'est si vous également en train de partager la question du féminisme. Tout en partageant vos problèmes. Et surtout, la plupart d'entre nous, nous vous dirons. La plupart d'entre nous, nous voulons donc. Je peux voir votre diapo. Yes. Yes, we can see it and please, um, you can go through it if you want. Donc, vous pouvez lire. Vous pouvez donc commencer à faire votre présentation. Hearing the translation. Anyway, this is of course the very first challenge to oh, C'est la première fois. Colonial languages. Oh. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Madam, could you, could you, in the actual translation, <laughs> we need, we need to help her to understand the system. In the icon of translation, tell her to mute the original uh, audio. Tell her to mute the original audio. <laughs> yeah, kindly, just above the interpretation flags, there is a place written mute original audio. <laughs> Professor Amina, can you hear? I'm here. Yes, can you mute uh, your presentation audio? And can the most mute people from, uh, because we are also hearing uh, other background noise, please. Oui, est-ce que les participants peuvent uh, couper? Oui, est-ce que les participants euh, peuvent aussi euh, couper leur micro, s'il vous plaît, parce qu'on peut entendre. Hello, hi, Mirel. Uh, yes. Maybe we can we can proceed. Uh, let's just try again. Um, so you have to select. So everyone has to select the English and then mute the original. The original. If we can just try that. So you go to the interpretation. You select English or French, and then you mute original audio. Okay. Can we can we try? Can we just have a quick test? No, but I think it's only the French ones that can, uh, that will have to... Yes, we've done that memory. Okay. Okay, fantastic. And yeah. is our, our French interpretation happening? Yes, it is happening. I can hear him though. I can hear him from my side. Okay, um, I can't hear Mirel. Oh, I'm, I'm here. I can hear him from my side. I can hear both the, the French and the English. I'm okay. Yes, I will go. Okay, so can we can we start? Thank you. Yes, please. can we proceed? Prof Amina, over to you, please. Okay, so am I unmuted and can you see my slides? Yes, we can all see your side. Very good. So I will proceed. Um, 
with, uh, yeah, it's really just to, to put out some information and share. I loved your slides, I want to say, first of all. This is the kind of daily bread that we should be feeding all our sons and daughters on. Um, and yet it's not across the whole continent. We have to come to Femnet or to uh, Africa Women's Development Fund to have what should be an everyday inspiration. I think we're getting better at it, but I'm going to share a few more examples. Mm -hmm. um, and especially because for the last few years I've been living in the US, so I've seen what the, in a sense, a bit more of the diaspora and uh, uh, had to understand why they actually conceptualize capitalism in terms of racial capitalism. So there are things to learn. Um, my point being that the diaspora has a very different vantage point on the continent so actually, it's a miracle that people across communicated across the Atlantic to the extent that we find that they did. Um, and let me just say a bit more about that. So I'm saying that in as early as the 1800s, feminists from Africa and of African descent were key figures in Pan-African organizing in a way that the, the male-dominated androcentric writing of history had forgotten. So here, because as a, the feminist of the feminist movement, and particularly the black feminist movement and black working in universities, there's a whole new generation of work uncovering women who move between the continent and the diaspora as activists. So here's uh, uh, a couple of them. I can get my slides to move. Um, Julia, Anna Julia Cooper, there's new work about her. Um, and as you can see, she was... Uh, born in North Carolina, wrote a book. See, the intellectual history of feminist African thinking is being recovered now, a voice from the South, and it became the first. So African, an African-American text. She was the daughter of a slave. So in flagging that slide, I'm saying that um, we can trace our roots as far back and as widely as we want. We could, for example, go back to the fact that long before the Germans had monasteries in which uh, studious men were, 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 were kept, the first university in the world was built by an African woman. It's one of my favorite examples, maybe because I work in the university, but Fatima El Fikri built the world's first university in 1679. So there's a very long trajectory we could trace back to the beginnings of the university itself. Uh, Fatima Al-Fihri was a Tunisian woman, a trader, my, a philanthropist. She built it in the city of Fez. And, you know, I did a pilgrimage there. So, you know, we, can, we should be doing our own pilgrimage. Karawin is in the city of Fez, an Islamic mm -hmm. university. So, you know, not only do we have a history as fighters, you know, people like to celebrate queens and warriors. I'm saying we had quiet, ordinary women who wrote and thought as well. And, and in a sense, these are the ones who left texts and traces that are now being celebrated. Um, here's another one. This is a Caribbean woman um, who moved from the Caribbean, was active in the Caribbean. But look, she became the uh, person who looked after our leaders when they were students in London. Delia Jarrett Macaulay, the author, is a Sierra Leonean feminist in Britain. She's uncovered a life that would otherwise have been lost to us because um, one thing we've learned is that African women get disappeared from history. Um, not just lost and forgotten and erased, but there's active disappearance. Some of the new work is shown. Um, here's another uh, favorite. People all know about Marcus Garvey, um, not least because of Bob Marley's songs. Bob, our beloved Bob Marley, did not mention Amy Ashwood the young teenage activist who met Garvey, captured his heart, married him, and was his uh, partner in founding the United Negro Improvement Association. Now, this was a pan-Africanist movement. It was a back to Africa movement. Um, it was a black capitalist movement, um, which is often identified globally and particularly out there as a pre, you know, early, early pan-Africanism. And indeed, in the diaspora, the main objective was recovery, escape, back to Africa. Uh, we won't go into it. She even, um, here she is, Mrs. Uh, uh, Garvey, in West Africa. And we're talking 1946. I'm saying there was traffic between 
thinking women, political women across the Atlantic. And there are letters and exchanges, for example, between African-American women and the ANC right through the 1920s and 30s until that exchange was banned by the Americans because they were so anti-communist, they didn't want African-American um, communicating with Pan-African, African organizations on the continent. But there was communication. Um, it continued much more in Europe. Um, and we have lovely examples from the, uh, um, this is uh, basically arguing that yes, I do say feminism originated in Africa because of the state of women's rights when colonialism happened. Those women were not free. Um, and some of them, you read their travel journals, it's when they got to Africa that they saw women, not cloistered and corseted, but doing labor, building houses, farming fields. Then they realized God didn't make all women subordinate the way we are. So I say it was the first woman travelers the, uh, with an anthropological eye who looked and saw other women doing different. They started to think, ah, maybe we too, we can do more. That's one, that's an argument. Okay, and here's a favorite of mine, uh, Claudia Jones. This is a Trinidadian communist. She was a black woman uh, leader in the Communist Party intellectual leadership. Um, in the early 1900s. And she was one of the first black women to really argue intellectually and politically uh, that race and gender had to be addressed alongside the class question. And in those days, the American Communist Party was involved with the anti-lynching campaigns um, and uh, a, a whole black resistance to extreme Jim Crow racism. Uh, Claudia was deport, jailed and deported. She's the person who founded a cultural resistance that we now know as the Notting Hill Carnival. Um, the British communists didn't have her in the leadership of their party, but she founded the West Indian newspaper and the carnival and mobilized the um, African diaspora in Britain, which at that time was primarily of Caribbean descent. Now I understand it's primarily of continental descent and recent. We must think how to engage and bring home our diasporan expertise. Uh, here's another new work by a young uh, scholar, Keisha Blaine, dedicated her PhD to recovering, recuperating, and re-understanding these women, not just as tokens, but as thinking, politically active women. We should know of Ad Adelaide Casley Hayford, who married a, a very famous husband. But after their divorce, she's the one who came back to Sierra Leone and set up the office of the um, United Negro Improvement Association. So you can see even then, this is early 20, early 1900, 19, mid, 19, early to mid 1900s. There are these links creating the globe and moving on. So here with nationalist independence, uh, even UNESCO recognized the problem of African history being erased. So this was a, a major project um, through the seven. Professor, Professor, not to interrupt. Um, uh, there is no French translation, so I don't know if uh, Famnetta. Yes, so the French, there's no French translator. There isn't, they are complaining, but please continue. Oh. Je ne parle pas bien français. Hein? Non, 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 c'est pas vous, c'est pas vous, continuez. C'est oh. pas vous, mais eux ne... Si ouais. je parle doucement, c'est mieux si je parle doucement? Non, 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 ça va, vous pouvez parler en anglais, ça va. Il n'y a pas de problème. Ça, c'est un problème pan-africain. Oui, ça, c'est vrai, ça, c'est vrai. Je suis très impressionnée avec vous, je vois que nous struggling avec la technologie. Oui. Um, in Feminist Africa, uh, with my co-editors online, um, we, we are struggling also to do translation. It's, uh, it's our, one of our big challenges. Uh, but things are in translation. Um, so coming to the continent, we had the UNESCO book, very androcentric. Our historian at uh, Nairobi now, Paul Zaleza, did the critique of this book and pointed out that although it was very important, and all Africa's best historians uh, were rewriting, decolonizing the past, but they forgot women. Hardly any mention at all. 
it's now when you, you know, because of where we are today, when you look at that boy, you say, what, how? But you know, our men are not alone. I always ask, how did, how did Foucault write the history of sexuality without a gender, not noticing that there are men and women? So the mind is interesting, a huge gap. Very. We try to address it uh, variously. This was one project back, back in the early 90s. I don't understand why this is still the major resource on the continent. There should have been 20. There are some other books, but like major books. I know Sylvia Tamale, I don't know if she's with us. She is doing a textbook on um, the law for African, from an African feminist perspective. So these are works to correct. A more visionary is the cultural and recuperation. This is actually an African feminist response to the UNESCO histories that left out women. Four volumes. We need 400, eh? but let's celebrate the four that we have. This was collectively done in collaboration with a, a Western feminist press, New York uh, uh, women, Women's Press. But it's done, it's the writing of African women. And this gives us a big leap forward because from then on we have many more examples, both from within that book and it started the business. These were done in the early 2000s. So we're talking late, late, considering what there is out there. Here's another example from, from close to home, one woman's jihad. If we want to understand jihad, we must look at women's participation in it. We must think about some of our contemporary Muslim feminists and how we can pursue feminist agendas across religions, both of which are imbued with male, male uh, domination as a, as a value. Here are some of the early examples. Just to add to your own pantheon uh, at Feminet, uh, we all have our favorites. These are part of what was recovered in the Women Writing Africa project to inspire us. Ndete um, Yalla, if anyone from Senegal can perhaps tell us more, um, I'm sure if we all sat together and pulled all our ancestries, we would add to this work. Even if we just pulled our own grandmothers and mothers, we would enrich what we know in order to move forward. Uh, here's one. Do we know Madame Yoko, a ruler? The medallion that she's wearing was given to her by Queen Victoria, head of the British Empire then. They exchanged letters. Madame Yoko wrote to Queen Victoria as a sister queen. Dear Queen, Sister Queen, your boys are making a lot of trouble here. If you like, I can use my military forces to control them for you. Do you know that rude English queen didn't reply? Yeah. Okay, so now some more political um, precursors. This sent uh, 1900s. I'm going to identify the libera liberationist liberal thinkers of the era. We were, may have heard of the European liberals, but contemporaneously, we had liberal thinking men before many women were getting educated and they have generated a legacy in women, among women scholars and intellectuals in Egypt. So we do credit Kasim, I think we should credit men like Kasim Amin um, and his legacy is uh, pursued by feminists like Kuda Sharawi. She was one we found quite early on because you know Egypt has a lot more documentation than many countries. Um, Egypt and South Africa have more archives, um, but Huda Sharawi um, and her descendants are, 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 are quite remarkable. Uh, early protests, this before the end, before independence, women sought the vote. With independence, we became citizens all over and could begin real modern feminism in the terms of pushing for uh, structural legal uh, policy changes. Um, so the point of independence is critical in the capacity the way we organize these days is a product of nation statehood. Uh, we all know before that many of us were minors. Nigerian women didn't get the vote until 26 in the year. Gloria Shafiq, she set up a battalion of 6,000 women and offered to support Nasser against the British, a woman's army. She killed Okay, and here's, um, here's another uh, Algerian, you know, we know of more. We tend to romanticize the women fighters. 
so did the movements. You can tell from this very glamorous picture of Jamila Bouhired that women were fighters and they were not only did they fight, they were celebrated as such at a time when the bigger world was shifting. Um, and that becomes more apparent. The later the movement, the more women are involved. Uh, it was very radical for, uh, for Algerian women to be trained as fighters in the 60s. Well, if we're from the southern and eastern parts of Africa, we know that that's what women do. And we also know that women are often disguised. Um, and all of Fanon's work on the veiling and the challenges of subversion under occupation um, are, are of interest to us. How they manipulated gender, how we manipulate it in our interests instead of using it to oppress sections of our population. We should be playing our gender in our interests, not against them. And indeed, that's what our movements have done. We put down bourgeois femininity and crops when women need to pick up guns and go to the bush. So why should women be forced back into heels and skirts? And what, not, not necessarily a fashion thing, but why should women be taken back after victories? That's Algerian independence there. Without women, everybody knows Algeria would not be free. And indeed, that is what every African liberation leader worth, worth worthy of Africa's people says. So here's the ones we do know we, we, that have been recuperated. Nowadays, we know a lot more about how hard the life of the woman freedom fighter was because women like Josephine uh, Mongus in Banagher did a whole book on women's experience in Zamla. So all of this is new. So now we have a more critical take on what happened to women in the liberation struggles, how no matter what they contributed. And you know, there was educational work. There was efforts to, 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 to bring, to change gender relations at certain points in the liberated zones. The prolonged militarism has been a problem for that zone because militarism is almost the antithesis of feminism in Africa. And that is why so much of our contemporary feminism has to challenge militarism. We cannot pursue gender justice when there's a war going on. War is uh, really the arena in which male supremacy is most extreme, even if we have women participating in it. It's almost anti-democratic through the chain of command. So if we fought our way to freedom, we have to undo and build a culture of peace if we want development to proceed. Um, and then there are many earlier writers. Uh, a colleague in uh, Ghana, a queer, um, has recently uh, recovered this, this work um, of Mabel Dove. And there's one that you have. Uh, we, we overlap a lot. Uh, Mrs. Ransom Kuti. Of course, growing up in Nigeria, she was uh, very big in our lives. There's now a full biography of her. Thank you, Nina, the late Nina Mbarak. And what I want to say, because we always quote them, but look at what they were writing, look deep. We find that uh, Mrs. Kuti in the 1940s had a very sophisticated gender analysis of colonialism. So we should read their work. This is a quote from her. She's doing an economic analysis of what women do in Nigerian society. This was not what English women were doing in the 1930s and 40s. So as a Yoruba woman, she points that with the British rule, instead of women being educated and assisted to live like human beings, their condition worsened under British rule. And there she describes it's a thorough analysis. Women of Nigeria are poverty stricken, disease ridden, superstitious, and badly nourished. And here's the injustice although they are the main producers of their country's wealth. Palm oil, brown nuts, oil, pottery, etc. So the productive role, we knew it. Nigerian women knew it. British women saw it. And they started in second, what was something called second wave, right to work. <laughs> African women have always worked. And indeed, we want to work less, <laughs> right to work. Okay, so but independence, the nationalist moment was huge for all of us, for men and for women, because this was what enabled women. With this uh, independence of Ghana, women came into politics. Nkrumah was the first 
uh, affirmative action leader to appoint women. He sent a woman a foreign minister to Canada. The Canadians couldn't believe it. They've never heard of a, a woman foreign minister. Africa was leading in terms of women's leadership and leading the world. Um, and indeed, starting the relocation of African knowledge to the University of Ghana. That is the man working on the encyclopedia. And we know that the diasporans, George Padmore, uh, no, sorry, Du Bois, and his wife, Shelley Graham, at the age of 93, migrated home, as they saw it, to Ghana to work on these projects. So these are the international threats. They all come home and by right, they should coalesce in West Africa, in Africa at the point of independence. And uh, our continental institutions should be the home of all African, you know, African knowledge production for Africans. Um, and indeed, our institutions should be informing our movements and, and our political struggles more effectively than at the moment. I want to point to the fact that feminism has, has strong legacies with and connections with socialism, both over there in the West, but at home, you know, Nyerere brought a working class woman to be a very influential leader, um, to sing and to mobilize. So women were used as not just uh, bringing food and catering, but mass mobilization, addressing rallies, in her case, popular music. Here's another personal favorite, Gambo Sawaba, um, who lived, by, uh, lived near, my dad was her doctor for many years. So Haji Agambo Swab is not a house of women, as the book says. She's actually a Nupe woman who was married into the Emir's house, very young, but then became a rebel and ran away and joined the left-wing political progressive movement. Neither of these women were given education. Um, their appeal was what we would call popular African feminism, and they were spectacular. And a more recent one, only one little film on this uh, feminist writer, um, but we have much to do. Femrite, we have much to do. And indeed, I thank you all for your attention. This is what we are doing. Feminists all over Africa and beyond. Some of us are a bit far from home right now, but we're thinking, imagining, analyzing, challenging, resisting, co-creating. To see what's happening in Africa on COVID, we go to the feminist website. So there's a lot of information there. So with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention and uh, say that uh, we must all, all hands on deck. And uh, at the University of Ghana, there's a little project that is resurging um, and a few of the other people involved in the rebuilding of our platform for Feminist Africans, uh, the journal, um, which we are about to relaunch. So I'm just going to say that and say, look out, watch that space. It's a forum where we hope to debate and take up and advance ideas and strategies on all our most pressing challenges. Thank you for your patience. Hello? 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 Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Amina. I am speechless was absolutely inspiring. I'm telling you, I have chills. Um, I have never heard of uh, over 70% of these women before. And, uh, you know, it kind of gives some of us a sense of walking, you know, with our, our heads high, knowing that feminists birthed it in our continent, but, and has left a strong legacy. And yet, you know, for the longest time, most of us just thought that we transplanted this ideology from the West and we'll be having conversation around feminism, but no one will really contextualize it as African women. And by reading and going through your presentation, there's a lot of things coming on my mind. I was like, oh my God, how do we continue the conversation? How do we go beyond the Zoom chat and maybe try to see how we can impose that uh, that this <laughs> presentation be disseminated, uh, mainstream uh, in our school curriculum is really important. I personally, I am 45 years old today and me learning about amazing women and we are now building on a legacy without really knowing the origin of a feminist, right? And I felt quite 
fortunate, but in the same time sad because uh, if I had to ask a lot of people here in the, the, in the uh, Zoom uh, to raise it, their hand, how many times we have uh, lobbied and also voiced our concern that there was not enough African women role models. And if even if you ask someone like me, myself, and my, my peers in the younger generation, the first name we'll come up with will be Thomas Sankara, um, Stephen Biko, will be Amikad Cabra, but no one thought of Oh, Professor Amina Mama, uh, uh, um, Marcus G Gavi is white. So I'm like really amazed and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Yes, please. Go. Yes. Let me just say something. Um, the, the Professor Amina Mama approach isn't correct. The reason I've been doing, you know, gathering a little bit of material here and there, kind of almost on the side, is it's actually, it is a bit personal. Because I'm away, I've found more time to do it. I've needed it more. But I'm saying on the continent, we need this even more. <laughs> and, um, you know, so, so part of why I, I treasure the open access online is because we can share it. Feminist Africa was set up in the year 2000 as a Pan-African product out of a community. So I'm saying it's not Amin or Mama. There's hundreds of us. And look at the 22 issues, that whole archive, it's an archive of its own. And we need hundreds of such archives, but that's the little bit that we can do. And I want to encourage all of us to mm -hmm. archive, because if you look at what is the data that those, what did those women leave that we were able to find and undisappear and bring back as the young African diaspora scholars have been doing so well. And so in such, and we know why, look what's going on here, murdering mm -hmm. black men by day, African women are seeking inspiration in the archives. And so, you know, here over in the diaspora, history and culture is a project on the continent. It's direct, it's direct information. So yeah. we have a, a much more, so the activation of that knowledge is why I'm so happy and so honored that you invited me to speak to activists we can use this to teach children and to raise them to affirm them so that where they come from is better informed in order to have more radical visions of where we might go to you know when you think of um, uh, you know we know the well-known examples the women's war hundreds of women singing and chanting and dancing and we know that the british troops fired on them and killed 53 but do we know that they bought hausa Muslim troops to fire on Igbo women. Mm -hmm. That's how the Brits did it. Do you think Igbo man, African man does not kill African woman? They had to bring their racial perspective and the religious crusader mentality so that those Hausa, and talking in Nigerian ethnic politics, Hausa men do not mind shooting Igbo women because they did not see them as women like their own. Yeah? So this is how men are used in ethnic war to kill others, uh, you know, so, so I don't think African men rape their own women, but if they've got a traumatized ethnic consciousness, they will rape someone else's woman in that, um, you know, I mean, we must just call it primitive. Yeah? We do have things we need to get rid of, obviously, that's one of them. So, so for me, what's exciting about this is what we can do with it, um, moving forward. And Feminist Africa is, uh, I, I, I actually find not to write it, especially because it's been there a while. We did write some in the first issues, but it's a platform. We edit, we, we, we convene it, we peer review it. So it's African feminist writing with the solidarity, support, and debate with others. And in a sense, that's the inner circle, the inner strength that we have to strengthen the most if we want our movements to be confident, strong, and happy, there's a lot of beauty in that history. Um, exactly. So I, even as we confront crisis, I'm saying let's ratchet that forward and let's talk about some of, let's, let's hear from women in this room who have built that knowledge, who are making that history and her history and, and let's share what's going on now and take the, the, the spotlight off me. Because I, I need to hear from all of you what you are doing. This, this work doesn't exist um, in a vacuum. So I want to hear from people at this point uh, and say this isn't personal. I've made it a personal interest, but it's, um, it only goes as far as, you know, so I think today, even I just sent a quick note, Sylvia Tamale, Hope Chigudu, uh, Georgie Tsikata, they're all on the new editorial collective of Feminist Africa. 
um, Jifa Tovike is our new coordinator. She's had a, there's a power failure in our class, so she, she can't join us. Um, but we should hear now about COVID and having inspired ourselves, uh, what's happening out there. I was involved in one report, uh, which is on the um, UNCDP website with Diane Elson. And I'll tell you the title, but um, I gave it straight up. More men die while women die caring. More men die while women die caring. And this is true in, in war. More men die. We must celebrate freedom fighting. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that's what, how I would like to invite people to think about how COVID, and indeed there's reports of Africa being one of the most successful places. Is this real? You know, um, the good news is getting buried. I've seen a few tidbits that say that our countries are so, it's a negative thing. We're so experienced with crisis and epidemic that we have had no choice but to become resilient in certain ways. Yes, exactly. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. No, thank you. We are the one thanking you and thank you to bring, you know, for bringing the knowledge to us. And I don't think that after listening to you that we all, uh, 60 of us plus, we want to share this story, but I'm sure it's a conversation that will go beyond uh, uh, this uh, Zoom group uh, chat and will FAMNET will ensure that FAMNET takes it uh, after the, the, this be, uh, beyond the uh, COVID that, you know, one day we all meet and continue the, the conversation and we'll make sure that, you know, be mindful of decimating um, information. And I think we, you know, the archive is there. There's not a lot of African, you know, documenting what is going on the ground, but now it's about going, moving forward for us, you know, really decimating the, the, the information across so people really know our story and we can really own up the space and thank you. Thank you for your intervention. Really inspirational. So I don't know if we're ready for Mr. Brian Kaguro, my brother, uh, after this powerful session with uh, our Prof. Amina Mama. I think you have the floor. The floor is open to you. Hello, Brian. Hi, how are you? I think after Amina's presentation, we should say amen and go home. <laughs> I kind of had the feeling you were going to say that, but we want to hear from you, Brian. Uh, Someone um, muted. Prof. Amina wanted to say something and she was muted. Can you unmute her, please? Can you unmute her? She's muted. Brian, Pro my brother, there's no escape. You cannot run away. We need, look at the, look at the brothers before you. <laughs> Um, so I don't want any escape. I'm very pleased you're here and I really want to hear from you. And indeed, I think there are some other brothers on the line because, you know, we talk to ourselves a lot and this is a feminine space. So you are welcome to a feminist space, but that means we really do want to hear. There are some other brothers here. I want to hear what you Yes, say. exactly. Yes. So Brian, over to you. Uh, I mean, excited. I am personally excited because you're a brother that I look up to. And thank you for the amazing work that you're doing in Africa and really fighting for uh, social injustice. You have fought a lot of fights and some of the, you know, you came out victorious and we applaud you for all the hard work. But I kind of also wanted you to walk us through your Pan-Africanism journey and, you know, sharing your, your fights with African, you know, government for them for all of us to come together and collectively work and and really respond to the COVID. So uh, I mean I, I'm I'm a child of the liberation struggle. You may. Uh, so I, I was shaped by the consciousness uh, first of the liberation struggle uh, and so the early part of my pan-Africanism is quintessentially anti-imperialist and anti-colonial that's how i was molded um then the second thing is that it was also the moment as you know that moment of liberation struggle for southern africa where black consciousness which was the link between the diaspora that uh, uh, amina talked about uh, and the african continent was huge so there was the anti-imperial anti-colonial but there was also the projection of 
your identity being a badge of honor, being black, not being the symbol and premise of shame. Uh, black is beautiful, black is powerful, uh, you know. And, and, and that linked with my student union activism and Zimbabwe and many Southern African countries, as uh, Professor Amina would tell you, were fairly left-leaning. Uh, and so was Tanzania. So in essence, internationalism uh, 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 and the idea of a leftist critique to global capitalism and in particular neoliberalism became a critical component of how we imbibed and embraced Pan-Africanism. We had contradictions because after celebrating Nkrumah, Nyerere, Samora um, and all the other great Pan-Africanists, it occurred to us that there were several claims, there were several components that made it incomplete. That the historicization, deification, elevation of those few men into the sole heroes of the African struggle was itself a Eurocentric approach. You will know if you come from uh, this continent that we often told stories of heroism where the smallest animal outwitted the biggest. But this narrative of history where, uh, based on some form of social Darwinism, where the toughest is uh, uh, put up as the, uh, as the symbol of our resistance. It's also men that interacted with the colonial enterprise and were able to speak in the language it understood that were uh, put up as heroes. So you ended up with an understanding of Pan-Africanism where you were not a Pan-African hero if you were not a head of state. So you ought to have led a political party or led a state. And this essentially meant the thousands of African women, as Amina has said, were excluded. African youth were excluded. African peasants were excluded. African scholars, except those who were very close to the few men that I've referred to were excluded. So we, we, I, we realized as young, young people that there was a need to actually reinterpret, reimagine, remold, and re-understand the dynamism of Pan-Africanism, devoid from two act narratives, that it was one thing, an exclusive meta-narrative, right? So it, it occurred to me, even as a youngster, that, as I mean, I said, Gavi was a capitalist. Uh, and if you look at the 1945 Congress, how did you have Kamuzu Banda, Jomo Kenyatta, and at the same time, Kwame Nkrumah, CLR, James, and others in the same room? Ideologically, they seemed to be at variance. And, and it occurred to us early then that one of the things that Pan-Africanism in its evolution has never been spared, or rather the three things that it has never been spared, are the contradictions of the evolution of an idea or a movement, the struggle of opposites uh, within it. The, the second thing that it was not spared was the class contradictions not just the opposites of ideation, but the class contradictions, right? And the third, that, that it was not spared, was the infusion of influence of other ways of seeing the world, whether socialism, uh, we're discussing today, feminism. And that's important because in thinking about the future, I'll come back to you. The second, the, 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 so African Renaissance happens when I'm already a Pan-Africanist. When I'm one of those young people who think that the world will be saved by slogan and by belief, when my Pan-Africanism actually had grown to the stage where you got satisfaction from purely just insulting white folk and imperialists. And then we met colleagues who began to say, it's insufficient to have an eloquent critique of oppression or an erudite understanding of its structures and its channels of transmission if you don't have an agenda that will take you out of the condition of being the dominated, the oppressed, the excluded, the silenced, and the disarticulated, and the disenfranchised. So then there began a contradiction in me. 
do I join uh, the pro-democracy movement, which for a long time we had critiqued because of its liberal leanings, as imperialism and you guys, that was opposed to the quintessentially African revolution. And if we did join, how might we infuse our pan-Africanism into conditions and conceptions of democratization? Uh, because we had long accepted, Mirel, that it was a myth and a lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That African intellectuals and academics were writing about the mm -hmm. problem in Africa of uh, democracy because of ethnicity uh, of, uh, and so on, identity politics. And so on and so on. And we were young. Um, and I recall a meeting in which the late Tajuddin Abdurrahim and I took on a very celebrated professor and said, Our reading of liberal democracy, if you take the American, is that the same men that stood and said, All men are created equal. Some of them were slave owners, some of them supported Jim Crow laws. Their country for that period, where there was both slavery and racism, was considered a democracy. Those same men that said all men were created equal until 1930 deprived women the vote. Those same men struggled to pass a law that recognized the rights of Negro people to educated and education and admission into higher education. So we said the history of liberal democracy was always xenophobic, racist, sexist. So when it comes to Africa and it takes on eth ethnic dimensions and so, it, there's nothing unique about it. It's very nature and its genesis and DNA had come up with this. So it then brought us to how do we, so my Pan-Africanism is being shaped. I, I'm reading uh, 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 Cabral and Cabral says all revolution is first a cultural revolution. And I I had been raised to believe, been taken to churches that saw everything African as essentially either backward, evil, or devilish. I had interfaced with colleagues who were Muslims who also had been raised to believe that certain things were sacrilegious. Our knowledge, sacrilegious. And those components of our culture, actually, that only that got talked about were the West. But like, as we read other cultures, we discovered all cultures evolving from feudalism, right? Uh, had were patriarchal, hierarchical, oppressive, number one. Number two, they were imbued with certain contradictions. So I began a contradiction in me that says, how do I embrace culture without seeking to build a monument around historicized fantasy? How do I look at the transformative elements of being African and African culture when my knowledge has been called evil, when my medicine is called evil? But I was lucky because I was lucky because that was the time when cultural icons campaigning against apartheid were rising. So not only was there free Nelson Mandela, there was this idea again of Africa opposed to the institutionalized racism, Africa. And then in the immediate uh, post-apartheid era, there was the notion of renaissance. So we began to say, no, but what are we, what is the recreation tool? And so a friend of mine, uh, actually a friend of my parents, bought me a book by Chancellor William called The Destruction of a Black Civilization. And another one called by Carter G. G. Uh, G. Woodson Carter called the miseducation of the Negro, and another one called the Antebellum South. And I was reading this side by side with Chunyo Achebe and with Fanon and with Cabral. And I almost quit law school because I didn't understand what I was doing learning the instruments of the dominant. So I was shaped by a radical left-leaning Pan-Africanism and learned to embrace the instrumental value of culture. Then when I had done that, I realized at university that studying law and becoming a brilliant lawyer could become the biggest betrayal that any self-respecting Pan-Africanist could become, partly for two reasons. 
the mystification of liberation that the rights discourse could potentially have by people who recite numbers in a constitution that no one has ever seen is actually a treacherous act because it makes that class, the lawyers, the only liberators, the only knowers, the only saviors. So we started now trying to say, how do we turn the knowledge of law into a popular conversation about struggle? So I joined uh, the early efforts with colleagues like Eva Joyce Wynn, uh, Brian Raftopoulos, and many others campaigning for constitutional reform in, in, in Zimbabwe. So democratization, constitutional reform, but also still anti-imperialist. And obviously that makes you an orphan mirror. You don't fit with the pro-democracy movement because they see the West as the friend against African dictatorship. You don't fully fit with the uh, African liberator generation because they think that anti-imperialism is a sufficient mask uh, for looting uh, and the sort of uh, uh, politics that was, has been transacted by that. So one felt that you set up easily in trying to solve this. That's where I've come from. That's what has shaped me. Brian, hello. Hello. Yes, how are you? Thank you so much. I, I don't even know if I should go to the next question because basically you cover them in one shot. But it's making us feel on the other side that, oh my God, we're still learning every day. It's a journey, uh, learning about our identity, learning about our forefathers, but learning now what your work, what you are doing, and also what Professor Amina is doing, um, reflecting on everything that you said about coming from a, a radical uh, perspective and and, and, and now I understand why you are being celebrated as deep and Africanist. But being, quote unquote, most of us feel like what the challenge that many women feminists have driving on, in the African society, it's because on the entire continent, we are under patriarchal rule. We are under patriarchal society. And having you now on board, be ready to get some of the questions. But I also wanted to have your sense in that. How do you see the role of your sisters here? Your sisters, your, your, the one that are younger generation as well, uh, the type of advices you have to give to any of us trying to reach finding the ways to the an African as well. And, and being a feminist as well. Well, I, I let me say something that will make you not invite me to the next feminine class. Actually, I was already telling memory that after the lockdown, the first people, the first conference ever, the first conversation dialogue, it's Brian and Prof. I mean, it's we, it's a must. You know, we have to do encore. We have to do it again. Yeah. So. So the point I'm going to say is, if Dina is on the call, um, and uh, Nora and all the former feminine directors, they will know that at one time I was so enraged. A fight went on within feminine. And I'm raising this on this call because in life I've always thought that raise the irreverent thing because it's important. Not just older women, but other feminists that were, for some reason, engaged in an unproductive fight. But I'll tell you what occurred to me without taking sides on who was wrong or right. I wrote a very angry mail and I said, so if I, if I, want, I don't qualify as a feminist, at least call me a progressive patriarch. I cannot understand why the rise of uh, any young leader should not be accompanied by the sort of support that we as boys in the corporate sector get, right? Uh, because it's one thing for men to pull you down, it's quite another for other women to pull you down. That was the first realization. And I'm, I won't go into a pretentious women pull each other down, that's not true. The second thing that I realized is I asked Dina, and I want to ask memory before I proceed, is feminine a feminist 
organization? No, not a platform that gathers women. Is it a feminist organization? And if it is, how does that politics define how it engages the rest of the world? Global funders engages the African Union and everything. I leave this with you because I want to say my advice to you is never apologize for your politics, but let your politics be definitive and defined and be discernible in how you act and relate, whether you are relating to other organizations or to funders. I, I think that for me, the reason why I have followed Feminet for this long is not only has it produced leaders and discourse, it has produced people who have unapologetically said, our politics is this, and this is our land. When you posit a politics, Amina has said the second advice. I realize that a lot of people in civil society, and a lot of us included, did not read sufficiently, did not write sufficiently, and therefore the discussions and, top, uh, and talking uh, spaces become spaces in which we regurgitate slogans and cliches. Yeah, this, wow. deep business, this deep business of getting into knowledge yeah, is something wow. that civil society and not just feminists needs to do. So I am the, third, now. the third is that discriminate against women's organization, consciously and subconsciously. And because of that, it is important for a politics to emerge, to engage funders. I know that um, uh, Amina and a lot of other people before you have engaged funders. We have an opportunity now, because of COVID, to have a conversation. I've been saying this, that everybody keeps on talking about frontline health workers. No, no, no. Let's strip that term, because that term hides a lot of the gender disparity. 80% minimum of the so-called frontline health workers on this continent are women. Yet every COVID task force, if it has women's representation, will have 10%, 15%. And the so-called funds that governments and even donors are issuing for responding to COVID, you will see that the percentage allocated towards things that will directly go to women is less than 25%. So there is, a, there, there is, my colleagues, there is a radical conversation we must have. It is one thing to be betrayed by the state, another to be betrayed by the funders and still find a moment where we actually sit there and not challenge that the, these people lie. I mean, you have funders saying we're committed to women's empowerment. We're committed. Say, show us your budget. Mm -hmm. Show us your budget as a sign of your commitment. Show us how much you've invested in women's knowledge generation. Show us how much you have invested in women's leadership. Show us how much you have invested as core support to women's organization just to keep them alive. If I treat organizations run by the Old Boys Network, and the feminist organizations the same, and the same stoic, rigid list of requirements, then what I am essentially doing is equalizing two things that are unequal because others have privilege uh, that they have accumulated over time. So my, there is a battle to be had over visions of post-COVID Africa. And the leadership by yourselves as the young feminists is important for two reasons. You have to invest more in generating knowledge and analysis, but you also have to invest more in, in onboarding a diverse leadership court. Mm -hmm. And I ask myself, how many of the online activists that may not be able to spell the word feminist may actually be feminists, exactly. and we simply haven't engaged them? Exactly. And it occurred to me that in civil society, and I had been part of this problem, we gather, we have our celebrities, our movement gigolos and movement divas. <laughs> we have a collection of resolutionaries because we used to be revolutionary, but we've become resolutionary. We're just happy 
that a statement of the African Union has a, has a sum of our language, and that's the fight, right? And our connection to the grassroots women is limited. Our connection to the women actually doing struggle in community is limited. And sometimes it's limited because donors insist on sending us to London and to New York, but won't pay for us to do real work. But sometimes it's limited because of our own class alliance, that we are unwilling, we do the same thing that we've always done in civil society, visit poverty occasionally to write a project. Now, it seems to me that the fourth advice I have, Mirel, is you cannot lead from weakness. So if you start off where I started off saying, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is weak, you will end up with a catalog of not only wrong things, but you end up classifying some people in the movement as wrong. So my, my idea is where I'm in a left, what has gone right? What has this movement, the current one done right? What have the movements before it done right? These continuities of struggle and linking generations, not in an adversarial manner, but linking generations, not just in handing over the baton, but linking generations as a cross-pollination of capacities and competencies. And it would seem to me then that would address the one thing that COVID has raised, which is a lie. This idea of social distancing. You know, when I, mean, I was talking, I stood up, I wanted to dance, because <laughs> think about this now. The greatest social distancing that happened in Africa was intellectuals business folk and elites who were taken into the diaspora not to get as conscious as Professor Amina and a couple of others got. No, they were taken to the diaspora to go and reaffirm white superiority. They came back, as Fanon says, to Africa. When they came to Africa, everything that they had already been taught was inferior, was more inferior. And the distance between them and their own people, their own culture and their own idea, identity was deeper. Most of these people became our ministers of finance. That's why they don't understand why your tax system must have caregivers. They don't understand why a tax system must empower women. They don't understand the conversation about the fact that we've not placed a financial value on women's work. Generally, they don't understand that when you are doing land reform, your primary land producer who produces 80% of the food we eat in Africa is women. They are looking for big business, big production, because their understanding of economy is quite abstracted from the reality of the women who I told somebody this afternoon, I will not accept another young Westerner coming from New York or London or France to come and teach women in the village budgeting and microfinance we have mothers and grandmothers who according to the world bank and others were living on less than one dollar a day who raised whole families and raised graduates such as some of you on this call you try and raise one child today on less than one dollar a day and see if you will be able to take that child to university your grandmother with the same income threshold and don't tell me it is because of inflation only it is because of sheer genius. She's alive today. She didn't have 10,000 doctors attending to her. I'm not saying we shouldn't have medical coverage. But until we learn that there are certain strengths that are in how we have evolved and developed, and until Feminine begins to look for that disarticulated hero, not just celebrities. And in fact, anybody who calls any of us, uh, what do you call this um, celebrated Pan-Africanist, is wrong. The media has created uh, certain people, given them profile. And I have learned something, Mirel. If you are ugly and loud, you get profile. If you are good looking, you get profile. If you are well dressed and well educated, you get profile. If your accent is good, you get profile. But that doesn't necessarily mean, number one, that beyond quoting Gavi and stuff, you are a Pan Africanist. Number two, that does not mean that your politics connects with the real struggles of your people. I, I just want to be known as Tamuka O'Brien. And I call myself Pan-Africanist to remind myself, I'm not the tribe I come from, 
although it's important. I am not the country I come from. The name of that country was a result of the fight in Berlin amongst white men who were drinking whiskey for more than 50 days, deciding which country to give to who. I am actually defined when I go elsewhere on the basis of the common destiny we share. So the last advice I would give uh, to you is simple, that when we are looking at what we need to do going forward, I don't think there's any work more radical than reimagining democratization from a feminist perspective and reimagining economies from a feminist perspective. Because everybody who's talking about a post-COVID economy is talking either about a capitalist economy on steroids, and the only difference they are saying it will be high tech, fourth generation industrial revolution. Surely, to put patriarchy on high tech only without imbuing it with the transformative value will not produce what we need. What does the transformation, both in technology, in knowledge and economy mean uh, for African women? And for that work, I will drag every boy who calls themselves progressive and myself included, not to come and lecture, not to come as pontificate, but to come and listen because we don't know. We don't know and don't assume we know. Every bit of economics that we studied was based on the patriarchal mode of production, the racist mode of production, and neoliberal mode of production. So I would like to come back to the next session, not as a speaker, but a student. Thank you, thank you, Brian. But I'm sure I will, you come, maybe come back as both. And uh, you've given, given us actually a lot to reflect on, uh, upon. Um, you know, that some of us cannot lead from weakness and uh, what we have learned from the types of Professor Amina, your type, and how to really re-engineer our mindset, the way we approach as African women feminists, uh, some of the, 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 the crisis, since we're talking about the crisis and, and the way to uh, we operate. Um, before going to a question, uh, there is, you mentioned something very important, which I don't want to lecture you. You've said a lot, but it's just for us to really ensure that there is a continuity mechanism linked to the next generation. And I think that is what is the struggle now that we have, and we are hoping that uh, people like you, the likes of you know Brian's, to come on board and really have a shape. Uh, uh, and link all of us together so to ensure that continuity and that our histories are not basically erased from the, the, the globe but we continue and, and I thank you, thank you very much for the time and definitely will continue to push that uh, FAMNET organize another session uh, face to face and I have to admit and I believe some of us this is by far one of the best webinar ever that I attended and, uh, and I enjoyed the two hours and we all want to go beyond because we feel like there's so much to learn and there's a wealth of knowledge that you guys are bringing at the table that we really don't want to let go. But, uh, you know, it always comes to an end. So now I kind of wanted to open the floor. There are feminists here among us that I would like to uh, them to also to share some of their, their, their perspective on addressing the issue of COVID-19 uh, COVID as a Pan-Africanist on the continent. I believe uh, we have um, our sister Hope in the chat room. If she's there, uh, we'd like to give her at least maybe five minutes to share her thoughts and her contributions before diving into the questions. Hope, are you here? Maria? Yes, is she? I, I think Hope had to leave. Um, but I, yes. yeah, I wanted to ask if we could really uh, pick up on the idea, because, you know, this thing of COVID is happening at the time when the um, declaration of an African free trade continental area has happened. And these two things need to be put in dialogue together. Because, you know, that, that's where we need to think. And I'm really, I really think we need a, 
may I say, another conversation in which we involve our people are always talking alternative economics, alternative economics. I, as a, a feminist, want to know what we want in that alternative economics and what we mean by it. Um, and um, I've been uh, following the debate um, that Hakima Abbas has been leading out of AWI, and they've actually put together a whole collective African feminist economic recovery plan and a strategy. So I just want to mention that because um, I was involved in some discussions about developing a lobbying strategy. Um, but, you know, clearly we need to be on the ball and thinking about what's opened up by the declaration of the biggest free trade area in the world, because we know what will happen. Eh? The neoliberals, the corporates, the 1% global, 1% will run with this thing and they're going to leave us, the African people, uh, behind again. Yeah? Without prospect, without retirement, with no small income, um, you know, crisis alleviation, poverty alleviation that perpetuates poverty. Small, small. So we need to think differently. And I want to invite people to think what kind of economic activity can free us. Because right now our economic activity is barely subsistence. Even at my level, I'm saying we're just ticking over. Nobody's making anything to lift themselves forward. So I want to table really the question of alternative and economic strategies in the aftermath of COVID, even the policy moment that we have in the African Union to ground it, ground the conversation. Definitely, yeah. and I agree with you, uh, Prof. Amina. Uh, last week, we actually had a uh, few Tutu fellows and I, we had a conversation with uh, the SG, um, SG, Her Excellency, Wamakele Meme. And I think maybe uh, we'll, we'll discuss it maybe with Famnet, if you will be open for us to have another session, you know, bringing Brian again. We are not letting you go, Brian, by the way. And, and, and you, Amina, and other women economists, and just having also a conversation with them. I think it's really important. I personally did raise the issue on women, peace, and security, and the impact uh, on the, the Africa trade because of free movement and all these countries being, you know, in the midst of conflict, how do we go on? How do we ensure that there will be free trade for these women, especially in particular women in informal uh, sector? So all of discussions, and uh, he, you know, there's still a lot of work, and he did uh, uh, mention that, but I will not speak on, on this behalf. But in the pipeline, I know he mentioned that he will <coughs> definitely invest on a center of excellency on the ground, really training the next generation of youth and trying to, to really engage with women. That is, was one of his uh, promises. Dictators in Nigeria set up training center for women. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about getting to basic economics. Exactly, exactly. So I think ideally we'll be maybe talking to Femnet having the next PPD session, you know, focusing on the, uh, the, F, uh, the Africa trade uh, with women feminists and economists and, and having you and, and Brian back, definitely. We'll discuss it with family team. Things are more, uh, more, more feminists who are better than me on economics, for yes. example. Yes. It's not, I'm more sort of politics, cultural. Exactly. Studies, partly because I'm away, but we all need to can we even retire from, can we even get home? You know what I'm saying? Everybody has an economic problem. Exactly. Uh, all of us. So let's see how we ourselves can come together and find ways to even get to the end of our little lives where there's no welfare, there's no public, everything has been, you know what, this capitalism that is prevailing now, it thrives on dis disaster. And every disaster, it regroups and profits while the rest of us are collateral damage. We know exactly. that as they were in the time of slavery. People are not being enslaved, they're volunteering across the Mediterranean. This is, we are in a, the crisis of crisis. So let's, let's, I look forward to further conversations and thank you. I really am so thrilled with the, the I'd like to have heard from the audience. You made Brian and I talk too much. Because everyone here has ideas. Yes. We want to activate and grow in this kind of conversation. So I'm looking forward to the next, it's my first. I'm sorry I missed the last one. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Now we'll open up the floor for a question and we kind of wanted to do it in organized way. You can just send me privately your questions and then I will, I can read them. Uh, Miral, yeah, yeah, on mute. Oh, I am? Oh no, sorry. 
Okay. Yes. Now we're going to open the floor for questions. And now, since we're kind of worried about the time, uh, please try to be brief. It's not a speech, but go straight to the point so we can get a lot of the answers needed. Hello. The floor is open for questions. Hello? Hello? Yes, uh, I am from Zimbabwe and uh, talking about the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, it is uh, a very good development, but what I know is uh, for it to take off seriously, to be different from other trade agreements, uh, it has got the protocol of free movement of people. And uh, from what I know, only uh, 22 countries signed the agreement sometime last year. Uh, I don't know the dates correctly, but only 22 countries signed the agreement. And yet only four countries have ratified it. Now, we know that uh, economic activity is linked with free movement of people. And I'm thinking about women here. As long as uh, there's no free movement of people, how will this agreement take off effectively? Because it's supposed to be taking off sometime, maybe in January next year. And for up to today, there are only four countries that have ratified the protocol on free movement of people. And maybe talking from as pan Africanists, why are why our countries reluctant to commit to the protocol of free movement of people? Thank you. We'll take three questions. Or comments. Or comments. So there is Carol, whose end is up. And um, she, 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 I hope I pronounced it right. No, so sorry. It's Carol. Sorry, it's Jen. You see where you it's Jen in love. I, I'm the one who has just asked the question. So I'll just put my hand down again. Uh, Carol, you want to come? Carol, you are muted. Anyone else has a question? Uh, Adote said he wants to make a comment. Please. Unmute. You're on mute, Adote. Okay, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm now unmuted, yeah. Okay, thanks for allowing me to make a comment. Um, uh, I would like to bring together the two issues that I think are connected, the issue about the COVID and also about the African, uh, the continental free trade area. The word that uh, has been used very commonly <clears throat> by the uh, head of WTO in this COVID thing is the word solidarity. I think all of us who have listened to him have heard this, him use this word a number of times. And yet that word solidarity clashes, as you have already said here, with the idea of uh, the nature of our economic system, which is built essentially around you know, private enterprise and neoliberalism, which emphasizes homo economicus, i.e. people doing things only for their selfish reasons and no state, no state. Imagine what would have happened without no state intervention in this crisis. Anyway, so what I'm saying is that the kind of eco alternative forms of economic organizing that are not private enterprise, that are not state enterprise, are cooperative enterprises. And I want to put on the table that this is an important thing that needs to be explored better. Now, very often when we think about cooperatives, we think that they are small. I just want to give, but they're small and that they are kind of marginal. They don't involve a lot of people. So I just want to give two, bit, two, two bits of information about that. One is that um, 
uh, some of you may not have heard of something called the Indian Farmers Fertilizer Association, turns over $2.9 billion a year. The world's largest worker cooperative in Spain turns over 13 billion euros a year. Okay, these are large scale activities, which we can, which we can usefully emulate and learn from. One of the most successful regions of, of Italy is a place called Emilia Romana, it's in northeastern Italy, which is the most, which is the fifth richest region of the European Union from having been the poorest region of the European Union after 1945. Why? Because one third of the population work in cooperatives. So what I'm suggesting is that it is time for us to really, when we talk about alternatives, we cannot, we cannot say we are going to challenge a neoliberal mindset if we don't challenge the neoliberal form of economic organizing. Because we will think the way we live. Yeah? So we need to take this seriously and we need to, to um, organize ourselves so that we can, we can achieve that. The challenge to my mind of African development or liberation is threefold. One is that we reshape our relationship with the rest of the world, that we are able to build African, viable African businesses that links into this question of the African free trade area. I'll just mention that in a second before I stop and that we also democratize our workplaces. Our workplaces are not only patriarchal, but they're dictatorial. And they are structurally unequal. They, they have built in structural inequality for reasons that I can't explain in the moment, but I'm sure everybody here, most people here will understand that. So we need to ch challenge that and the cooperative form deals with each of those or can deal with each of those. Um, we need, as has been said, we need to build strong African business organizations. Otherwise, the, any foreign enterprise will come and set up in any African country and with no or little or low uh, trade uh, tariffs will dominate the whole market. So we will, have, we will have unified the continent under foreign domination. That is a nonsense. In order for us to, to stop that, what are our alternatives? Either we have private African capitalist businesses or state enterprises, or we can also look at cooperative enterprises. And we can do that systematically and sensibly. So I'm saying that I want to put this on the table and I would really be appreciative if, um, if this is something that can be taken up and for people to look seriously at it. Just to end with one last statistic, 100 million people in the world are employed by cooperatives. 800 million people in the world depend on cooperatives and the bulk of those are women. I think I should stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so far you are giving us a lot of work, a lot to reflect on and I'm hoping and I hope that uh, FAMNET team is taking note of everything and will share I'm sorry, this is a democracy. I've, I've appropriated someone's computer and they have a class. Okay. Uh, remember I mentioned I was using my daughter Abian's computer and she, you know, we're all Zooming online. So I'm going to have to leave. Um, but I, I'm really interested in this um, because it seems that where we failed really is in the democratization of the economy, even mm -hmm. in taking ownership of, of our economies as a continent at any level. So I'm, I'm very interested in this because this is uh, uh, anti-imperialism materialized. Exactly. So how do we resist continuous removal of our assets? Mm -hmm. uh, as my child says, I'm just following our, our things. You took all our stuff, now I'm here. You know, yeah. we want to reverse that. And we, but maybe we need to start from the ground with the relationship between producers and, and, oh my goodness. Okay, well, this is an interesting line. Um, but I'm going to have to sit apart. And I want to thank you. Just let me leave with a thank you. And this is what we must do. We must talk. Yes. We must talk. Um, yeah. I had, thank you so much, Professor Amina. I had actually sent you a, a private message. And uh, I will follow up on that. So if, any, if anyone wants to have a question, Amina, I will advise you just sending it to FAMNET team and maybe they can send it. 
will thank you so much carry the questions over for the next time i see they're right on topic um nancy adote uh, yes. uh so, so let, let's be to be continued amen thank you all very much thank you very much thank you bye-bye so uh carol uh do you, would you like to ask your question you are up. uh yeah it was going to go uh to professor amina but um I would be happy to hear uh, Brian's response on this as well. But um, in owning our own narrative, and you did mention um, the well, you dropped in women empowerment, and it's something that um, we are also locally in Tanzania trying to really change that narrative and say because of uh, the history of development um, organizations and all these concepts and the uh, issue of sloganeerism, we are so quick to jump on the wagon without amplifying or rather even acknowledging our own um, contexts. So you, did, you gave a very good example of um, women, you know, how they, they are able to perform a lot of duties and how some of us cannot even rise to that occasion. But my question to you is how do you, how do you suggest we deal with the beautiful development partners who uh, somehow even insist, even in, the, in their call for proposals, you know, in their funding windows, in their conferences and whatnot, how do we get away from this co popular context of women empowerment that has clearly painted the African woman as inferior, as the victim, as the, you know, a person who basically does not have any power? Over to you, Brian. You are muted. I thought because of time, you could take uh, three more and then uh, try and answer. Otherwise, uh, you will yes. have just uh, Brian and I'm in a show and not heard enough from others. I know. Can we take two more, please? Do we have any more questions? Or we should uh, just let Brian answer uh, Carol's question. Uh, we had Atika and Wanjiru. Maybe they can quickly come in, Atika, then Wanjiru. Hello. Um, hello. Yes, hello. We can hear you. Hello, we can hear you. Wanjiro or Tika, because this is Wanjiro speaking. Wanjiro, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Say thank you for having this forum. Um, as a woman who writes about Pan-Africanism and who had started um, an episode on African feminism. So the time it will like there's no one really working towards these things, or there's no one about the same things. But I'm glad we it, it affirms that more people are into it. So I didn't uh, get it. Uh, uh, Wanjiro, since we did not get your question, can you quickly write it up? Maybe we can read it. Maybe Brian can. Hello, Wanjiro? Hi, I'm sorry I'm having um, network issues. Let me just write it. Yes, please write your question. And does, Atika, are you still on Thank the you. line? Or maybe Brian should go ahead and. Uh, and address Carol's question. I think, Brian, you can. Yes, I think so, while she's typing hers. 
So in the, in the left, there is something that we often say that those who control the means of production, whether the means of production are land and within the context of financialized and digitalized or digitized globalization, it's technology or ICTs uh, as well. So those that con control the means of production control the relations of production. And they determine both the outputs and the benefits of production. The fundamental struggle around women, land, women in the factory question, and women and technology is key because Adote raises the issue about cooperatives. And in the imaginary going into the future economy, these cooperatives will not just be soap making alternatives, uh, right? They will be huge. I think he's talking about manufacturing. Uh, he's talking about a whole range of economic activity uh, and its organization is, is, is imagined this differently. And, and so what the relations of production speak to how you organize production and how you incentivize production and who benefits from that production. And, and I think the most fundamental thing that Akima Abbas, Nancy Kachingwe, and Adote and Co, uh, and many others are working on, is not just a radical reimagination. It is a practical reorientation. I want to add that one of the things that would need to happen in the reimagination is a reimagination of the inseparability of economic and social policy within the African context. So because we have many people here who have come from an NGO background, we are all going to be made by donors to run around on healthcare, 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 COVID, COVID, COVID. But when you look within the African context, this is part of a continuum. It's part of a continuum and Adote points to this as did Amina earlier, how the state is conceived and its role, uh, right? Never mind all the other things that we say. So it's very important that this be led. That's why earlier I referred to a radical reimagination of democratization and not just democracy. So I, I mean, so that we don't get into controversy, it's important to have X number of young people and women in parliament, in local government. But as long as it is running on the basis of the current dogma, what you're going to have is a conscription of some of the best energies of our movements and uh, soiling of the same. In fact, we used to say that politics often takes the best of us and makes the worst out of them. But how do we make reorient that politics? I think that cross-movement organizing, one of the things that the feminist movement has taught me as Brian, is this idea of intersectional analysis. Mm -hmm. This idea to escape a single issue approach, a single issue focus approach to what you're doing. The economy and healthcare, the economy um, and, and, and well-being and welfare are all interlinked. And what the new work is pointing to is we had cooperatives, maybe one particular form before, but these were so powerful in shaping, if you look at the cooperatives in Uganda, in Mozambique, uh, even in Kenya, are there different ways that Africans organize that can generate value so that we don't create an orthodoxy that says there's only one way of organizing the economy that will get us the sort of value that we want. So my plea is uh, donors are going to be donors. Let's not forget that when you look in your countries, most donors will give a lot more money to organizations, if you are in the southern part of the continent, that are led by white liberals than they would to an organization led by Hope or Nancy Kachingwe. Let's also not forget that elsewhere, they'll give money to somebody who will rapidly mimic and repeat and regurgitate every single one of their orthodoxies than they would to radicals. So what do we do? I think my advice, Carol, is that let's actually take the fight to the, to the donors. 
they have always posited themselves as the doyens of accountability, the ones that are about participation. Let's call this bluff. If across different movements, Africans begin to call the racism of funding mechanisms, the patrimonialism, as well as the condescension of some of the funding mechanism, let me tell you something. There's going to be a revisiting of that conversation. No one wants to be the ugly duckling, especially within the donor community. It's a very fickle community that's based on this uh, political beauty pageantry, where it, is, it wants to always look like they are doing better than everybody else. So organizing ourselves across, you see the problem we had when I was working with civil society platforms in Zimbabwe and on the continent is that the betrayal does not come from lack of ideology. When it comes to personal political economy of the leadership of civil society, you'll come together as a collective to agree a radical agenda. One will go behind you to distance themselves so that their own funding is bigger. So in dealing with that, let's actually now take advantage of two things. There's never been a time in history where within funding agencies, we have Africans. I won't call them progressive Africans. Africans that are at least sympathetic to the feminist struggle, but sympathetic to thinking about alternatives. But that sympathy needs to be leveraged by constituency. And we need to do what we learned from, from, from previous struggles. If you can't persuade them through logic, blackmail them through, you know, in a, in a sense, I mean, it sounds so drastic, but I'm not going to sit around again or allow anyone to sit through the indignity of being forced to become liberal when their agenda is not liberal or being forced to turn down what they're asking for because it doesn't fit a predetermined donor agenda. This is inconsistent with their own frameworks, whether it's the Accra agenda for action, the Busan framework or the Mexico framework. Local ownership, coordination, and relevance and driving is what's important. And on the agenda where, I mean, I, I, you know, the idea of the Caucasian world saving the African female or the male saving the African female is a dominant narrative that needs to be contested. Exactly. Contested using knowledge. And, and I, I like the work that, um, the, the, that Akima and Nancy and, and, and others are doing but also contested using organizing. I think we need to have a critical mass of African intellectuals and activists that begin to call this for what it is. It is pretentiously empathetic racism. The fact that you don't call us niggers and kafirs doesn't mean you don't treat us as such. So let's say it. We are thinkers, we're not just doers. We're not just the muscle that implements what we've thought about. And we also need to contest this idea of mirroring. Let me, uh, the, the accent may be problematic. When English came to Zimbabwe, it came by South Africa in a ship. Even the fish didn't catch it in South Africa. By the time it got to my country, it was a problem. Mirroring, like, like taking one mirror to reflect something, um, right? Is there is a notion within certain funding orthodoxies that our society must mirror theirs in thinking and in everything. Whilst I embrace universality, I think that it is useful that we call this. And let's use COVID. COVID is an excuse for doing subversion under the guise of re-engagement and re-imagination. After the COVID window, we may be taken back to writing long proposals and uh, log frames. So let's use this moment of, lo uh, of COVID to do uh, uh, what you like, to undermine, to subvert these orthodoxies. Let's empower new thinking within the funding regimes. And there was no other question. I just wanted to emphasize the one thing, that ownership of assets is key to women's empowerment, including rural women. How do you get to own assets? Do you use the model of individual ownership or, as Adote begins to suggest, you look at an alternative mode where, I mean, I mean, these white folk have been doing cooperatives, Adote. They simply call it crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, or crowd this. They find a fancy term to describe exactly what we talk about. 
So capital itself has been built on this basis. Is there a link to Pan-Africanism? The link to Pan-Africanism is this. What kind of capital will not decapitate women, but will in essence allow, create space for women as owners, as drivers and determinants? And in our reimagination of capital, we need to imagine that. Should we continue contesting financialized globalization and digitalization? Let me just give you one thing and I'll end with that, Mirel. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Uber, Uber that we all saw love, does not get taxed in Africa. We use it, the taxation goes to America and elsewhere. Hmm? So does Amazon and many others. The African countries' taxing rights, which would enable us to raise domestic resources, are undermined because we don't control significant components of the digitized or digitalized economy. We are using Zoom. Every other meeting we're going to have, and we've been tweeting, we're going to turn some young American or British into a mega billionaire. And very soon they'll become a telescopic philanthropist, throwing the change that they've gained from our constant meeting using their technology back at us. That's why I think that the reimagination of the feminist economy must also come into the democratization of tech and its ownership. So not just owning land and soil, but owning tech and owning and controlling knowledge. And the question of intellectual property rights becomes an important array and an important terrain of struggle. Everything is on the table as a terrain of struggle. Do we and have we and can we gather a wide enough cross-section interdisciplinary of feminists, of women to fight in this struggle and to fight with knowledge and with passion? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh my God, thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Professor Amina, thank you, Dr. Adetoy, for your intervention. Unfortunately, we went over 20 minutes, but I believe it was worth it for us to hear from experts. Uh, you brought so much expertise and knowledge, and you really set the tone for thought-provoking uh, ideological session, and, and it's really helpful, and hopefully, FAMNET uh, will help design uh, the latter function of the PPDs. Uh, again, thank you. I will pass it on to uh, FABNET Executive Director, Memory Kashambawa, for a vote of thanks since we're over time. But thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Memory, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mirel. Uh, I really want to thank Professor Amina, even if she's left. I think she inspired us a lot. You know, when she was speaking, it occurred to me that when we go to the African Union, there are walls and walls with men who are, you know, the, all the African presidents and the Pan-African, who are termed the Pan-Africanist. And there's only one wall with a small, I think it's four by maybe 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters portrait of the Pan-African Women's Organization, which was the first organization which was created before the organization of African unity. So our pro well, my project is to really turn, we saw all those amazing, amazing women. And I think we should really lobby to have a wall within that African Union space it is our space, it is our, our place, we must rewrite the history. I really, really uh, was inspired today, and I'm sure a lot of you, I want to thank you so much. Um, Brian, you asked a question whether Feminet is a feminist organization. I will not answer that because we should not be asking that. We should not say, but we should do, we should act. So until there's a question until we get to a point where you don't have to ask, you just have to see that we are a feminist organization, our values, we are steeped in the African Feminist Charter. And I think just to end, um, Nancy shared the African Feminist Charter. So I'll really, really during this time, please don't just read it, but apply it. 
um, this is one of uh, reinvented and really let's leave by the African Feminist Charter. I also just wanted to share that um, I think there's a lot we will be sharing um, Prof's uh, presentation and we'll definitely be having um, another presentation. We are not going to stop. Um, these are the kind of um, think processes where we really need um, to continuously meet and really start breaking down everything that, that, that was said. I think there's a lot of trick off a lot of things. We will be having a separate um, Francophone webinar on the same lines uh, because we recognize we, we were not able to have our sisters uh, from the Francophone. Um, so we'll, we'll also try and improve and see what we can do so that with the Francophone, we'll also try and get translations for our Portuguese sisters. So we'll definitely make sure we have it. Um, I also want to say that we will also um, be, we, we have what we call the African Feminist Macroeconomic Academy. So this is, um, this is where we, we really simplify macroeconomics and some of the issues that came up like the African Feminist Economic Recovery Plan will be asking you to sign to sign on a letter to the special envoys. So starting on Monday, we'll be mobilizing for your signatures. We really want to have action. We want to present this to the African Union Chair, um, Cyril Ramaphosa, and also the African Union Special Envoys, which, um, which were appointed for the COVID-19 response. So we'll definitely be sharing that. And I also want to share that starting from next week, uh, we're also inviting you to join the global, um, the AWID. They are having a campaign which is called Feminist Bailout. So I've just shared the link and I'm really urging you. You know, we, 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 we owe it within Africa to be really pushing up, to be really pushing, pushing uh, the agenda in the global space. And we have been leading in that. So please join that campaign. It's from the first of, um, from the first of, it's on Monday, the 1st of June to, the, to Friday, the 5th of June. So once again, I really want to recognize all the sisters. I can't mention your names, but uh, as we end, it's a Friday. Um, yeah, in Nairobi, we are already in the curfew. So I just want us to continuously, um, if you've got questions,